sensei teller looked at me, the first thing he said is, I want to see you do a cock. That's the old Shorenji Ru. I said, you're right, sensei. He goes, they don't teach that anymore. I said, I know, sensei. How are you? What's going on? Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 750. My guest today, Soke Tim Spies. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. I don't care if you do karate or taekwondo or kung fu or something else. If you train and you love to train, that's why we're here. If you want to go deeper, find out more about what we're doing and why we're doing it, well, then go to whistlekick.com. It's where we post all the stuff that we've got, all the links, so much good stuff that we're putting a ton of effort into. It's not just me. It's a whole bunch of people with a lot of effort to support you in your journey as a traditional martial artist. One of the things you're going to find at whistlekick.com is a store because, yeah, we do make stuff and you can use the discount code podcast 15 because we sponsor our own show in a sense. The show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes each and every week. And the entire purpose of all that, well, it's to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to support that work, there are so many things you can do. Yeah, you can make a purchase, but you could also do free things like tell people about what we're doing. Maybe share an episode. Follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you could think of. Or think about joining our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can get in as little as two bucks a month. And the more you're willing to spend, the more we're going to give you back. We've even got a school owner's mastermind in some of the upper tiers. And you can write off your Patreon contributions at that point. If you want the whole list, everything you can do to help us out, whistlekick.com slash family. I had a good time talking to Soke Spies. We had fun. You know, talking about a, a little bit, how do I put it? Not quite an unconventional entrance into the martial arts, but not a common one. And yet, like so many others we've had on the show, a very quick resonance into what traditional martial arts is. I'm not telling you anything that you all don't know. You've probably felt it too. But it was that feeling that kept him in despite being pulled away and moved around a few times. So here we go. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. No problem. Well, I like to start in a pretty basic way because it gives us the foundation for everything else we're going to talk about. When did you get started with martial arts? Um, October 1st, 1984. You know the day? Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. The paper I got, I wrote up in the corner the day. I That's so cool. Okay. And why? Why did I? Well, I was yeah. at the time I was 19. I was in my first year of community college and uh, my army buddy, my buddy, best friend at the time, army came home on leave and we're actually going through the town of Bethlehem and we're just going in the old park down by Baravian College and uh, drove up behind this guy and he thought I was on his tail too much. He gets out, he comes over to my door. He was this skinny, scrawny, long haired guy. And at the time, I had been working out a, a lot. I was an assistant coach for a fitness team and okay. doing karate. And, um, you know, I didn't know what this guy was going to do. So I locked my door and uh, he just went off on me. And uh, my buddy said, oh, my God, he said, you could have just destroyed him. I said, yeah, you know, because I was fit. I was strong, you know, and that's what sparked me. I'm like, you know what? I stopped putting up with this. Mm. Oh, I find out years later that I probably did the right thing. Lock the door and just <laughs> sure. go, you know? So, um, but yeah, that's what sparked me. And I had just gotten tired of it and I got into it then. Okay. So when you're, when you're saying you were tired of it, that suggests to me that wasn't the first <laughs> occurrence where maybe you're like, oh, you know, I always been, I had been so, bullied yeah. in elementary school, like really putting a headlock on the basketball field mm-hmm. and, and I was bullied on the baseball team my ninth grade year and bullied a little bit in junior high and in fact, pretty much. And um, so I just finally said to one day, you know, I really got to learn how to fight, take care of myself. So mm. it kind of stemmed for many years. Okay. And what was the process like once you've made that decision? Did you say, I, I definitely want to go do 
martial arts or I want to go do karate. Did you know of schools in the area? What was that discovery no, I, process? I actually uh, I conferred with a friend of mine, Mark Bud, uh, Budgie, and uh, he was one year behind me in high school. And mm. so he was on the fitness team. So I worked out and I just said something to him. He's like, yeah, I'll tell you what, there's a really good guy that uh, this person, his friend knew that uh, took karate. So you ought to go see him. So I did. And it was Master Tim Hawk. And it was in Ema SPA where I grew up. And uh, I just happened to get lucky. He was, he was a great teacher. Uh, you know, very Eastern. He had more of the Chinese influence. But he did take Shorun Ru up until his fourth dawn. And uh, he'd been doing martial arts at that time, probably for about 25 years. So he was, he was very good. Um, and I just got lucky and got in with a good group of guys. And I'm actually, I'm still friends with them today. Oh, that's great. Okay. So t talk about those early days. And, and I, I want to take the opportunity to point out, you started at an age that is quite uncommon. Yes. Most people start when they're very young or, you know, maybe thirties, mid thirties, kids are kind of established and quite often they're, they're going back to something they used to do, or at the very least, I always wanted to do this. Right. We've had some people that start in this age group come on the show, but it's, I, I bet I could count them on one hand. So what was, what was that like? Well, actually my school, it was at a, uh, I'm not sure what, what state you're in. Um, I'm right? in Vermont. You're where? Vermont. Okay. So in Pennsylvania, they have these um, volunteer fire departments. <clears throat> Some are volunteers, some are, but they always had a social hall where they had weddings and they had a bar and everything. Well, this karate class was in the basement of it and it was a tile floor, um, very few windows. And, uh, you know, so when you sparred, if you hit the ground, you're going to feel it. Um, but surprisingly, the majority of people in my, in my class were, uh, I would have to say 16 years or older, Interesting. as old as 60 at the time. There was one mix. in the class. And um, so as years went by, I noticed the huge uh, evolve with uh, little kids. It mm -hmm. became, that became, you know, the thing. And people from, I would say, 18 to like 40, just they weren't interested. And it, it, it surprised me, you know, because I was and, and I don't think the world's gotten any safer. Um, so, uh, but that was the one thing I, I noticed over the years, how that evolved and changed. Uh, but yeah, we, uh, the, the class was great. I mean, um, everybody was really positive. We worked out hard. Uh, during the summer, you'd leave there and your, your gi was just ringing wet with sweat. So you got a good workout. Yeah, I remember those days. Now, you said you come in, came in anyway from a, a fitness background. You know, to me, that means, you know, weightlifting and things like that. And there's a discipline that comes from that, especially you said you were on a team with it. Some people would draw quite the similarity between martial arts training and, and being in a conventional gym. Others are going to point to the dramatic nuance between the two. You can't just charge forward and, and expect progress in martial arts where, you know, yeah, you can, you can just kind of keep putting up weight and, and see some progress. Maybe it's not the most efficient way, but it's an option. Was that an asset to you or was that a liability? No, I would have to say that, uh, first of all, the fitness team I was on was, you may have uh, participated in this high school. It was, this was called the Marine Corps Physical Fitness and mm. Marine Corps sponsored it. And what it was is it was a competition that you uh, were in your, your high school years. And it usually started in February and went to May. The national mm. was in May. And there was five exercises. It was push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups. Oh, okay broad jump and a 300 yard uh shuttle run which was uh, like it was 60 yards apart so <clears throat> i'd gotten into that in 10th grade and what we did was we did a lot of pull-ups a lot of push-ups a lot of sit-ups not not a lot of weights mm, okay it was almost like a pseudo gymnastics mm. you know? so <clears throat> what i found interesting was is that when i went into karate with that strength it was it was great because I had pretty much started my centering, started my balancing. Um, I've always said, if you want to become really strong, just do those three exercises, push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups. It's yeah. training and it's, and it's great. Um, 
you know, years later in 2009, I met up with a guy, you may have heard of him, uh, Dan Millman. He's been on the show. He has. Yeah. Okay. yeah great guy. Well, him and I are great. Him and I are good friends. And I nice. met, I met him at a, um, one of his uh, peaceful warrior things. And, um, we started talking and he, and he'd said to me, he goes, he goes, I can pretty much guarantee you that the reason why you stuck with karate was so long is because of that fitness training that I did was very similar to what, I mean, not to the, it's not to the length of him. Dan is just a a powerful guy. (laughs) 75, I think. And, um, but yeah, so, uh, I actually found that that helped me and, uh, it, it really made a difference in my training. Oh, that's great. Okay. So here you are, you're, I think you said 19, you're in a mix with a group. I'm going to guess it's mostly guys. Yeah. Old school training. You said 84 tile floor. I remember the, I was, I was younger, but I remember the culture of training in the eighties and you're still going. So there's, you know, we can't even call it foreshadowing. We're, we're in retrospect here. Was there a point in your early days where you said, you know what? I think this is my thing. Yeah, I think uh, what happened was, so <clears throat> the syllabus that my teacher had, it was very unique. It was very, very heavy in um, kata. And um, he just, he had a great system. It was called Senlin Shuan, meaning Shaolin Fist. And he took... Shorin Ru and Goju Ru, and he mixed it with a little bit of Aikido, a um, little bit of Judo throws, and then um, some white crane uh, Chinese Kung Fu. And uh, but what was interesting was from brown belt third Q to black belt, I had to learn 14 katas. <laughs> yeah, 12 open hand and two weapon. Oh, man. Um, so and his thinking was that, well, once you get your black belt, he'd always said to me, 5% of the people that take karate end up getting their black belt, which is about true. Um, and then they stop. They don't go any further. They don't go. Further. So he thought, well, if I can get you to black belt, a real good black belt, and you go off on your own, that's good. Because, you know, I have always said the student always reflects the teacher. Mm-hmm. So um, with that being said, I took it for two and a half years and then I made the decision to go in the air force and I just needed to, <clears throat> I needed to, you know, pop smoke, get out of the town, leave the house, that kind of thing. And now I left with a third Q Brown belt. Well, in my travels in the air force and then after that uh, college, I started visiting some other schools and I noticed that they just didn't even compare to what I had learned at a third Q Brown. I was like a second degree black belt out there. Hmm. And I'd go to seminars and I'd go to training uh, sessions and guys would be like, why do you have, uh, why do you have Saison or why do you have Kusan Ku? That's a, that's a black belt. Uh, God, I'd be like, well, it's, it's what my teacher taught. And they always gave me that, you know, that laboratory retriever look like this, you know, like that doesn't make sense. So what they didn't understand was I didn't come from a pure traditional Okinawan style. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that. That was pretty much it. Did you enjoy kata? Oh yeah, I I still like it. It's I think it's the I think it's the foundation of of karate, Okinawan karate. I think that you can get uh, all of your application, all your oyo out of it. Um, I believe that it's. Uh, let's put it this way: all Okinawan karates have it. The master. That's it. And it is, it is truly the foundation to um, Okinawan karate. I, I think it's the foundation of martial arts. The, you know, we, we, can, we can pull anything from forms you want, from, from technical application to uh, calisthenics. To, yeah. it's, it's, all, it's all in there. And that's, you know, I get, I get defensive when people push back on forms as being irrelevant. It's like, well, imagine you took all the things that you would ever want to train in martial arts and Put them together in a nice, neat package that you could work on by yourself. That's for us. Right. <clears throat> okay. So you, you left you left home. How far did you go? Uh, I just went to, uh, well, I was in the Air Force. I went to San Antonio, okay. and then from there I went to McGuire, New Jersey. 
So far enough that you're you're not going back to the original school to train on a consistent basis. Right, exactly. So uh, because I only lived about 90 minutes from my hometown being stationed in McGuire, <clears throat> when I would get some time off, I would go back and I would train with them. And it was pretty much just, you know, maintenance, not really, uh, not really learning anything. And then after about, uh, I think it was two or three years, my, my master instructor left and he moved to Virginia. Mm-hmm. But the one guy that I was training with that I was even Steven in belts with, uh, his name is Dennis Herring. Him and I and another gentleman, Barry Pilar, um, we just trained together and uh, didn't really, I really didn't go there to learn more. Um, I was just trying to maintain and I talked about me going to other schools and walking in and trying to literally talk to the instructors. And they just, you know, I, I would start to talk to them and I would ask them questions about their belt system and, and their information. And I said, well, you know, they, they wanted me to pay them. Like, you know, at the time I think it was like 80, maybe 85, $90 a month. And I'm like, well, can you show me a syllabus page that, you know, what I'll be learning? Mm. They, they just, they looked at me like I was crazy. And they were like, no, we don't really do that here. I go, well, I go, honestly, I said, I said, I am not a novice karate person. I said, I have a lot of knowledge and a lot of kata and technique. I said, I want to know what I'm going to be learning from your school. And they basically just said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you as we go. And I was a little apprehensive to that. I was like, well, I don't know about this. And um, it's time to change in the four, in the four or five years. And I just, it, I just didn't feel comfortable with it. So I just, I just stuck with my, um, with my martial art and um, I just continued to train by myself and with some of my friends. Sure. No, at some point that changed, I'm sure. Yeah. So where where was where was the line? Where did you did you get stationed somewhere, or did they move away, or what was it? Oh, what happened was is I I basically was in the military. I did my time and then <clears throat> stayed in the reserves, and I got called up for ten months for the Gulf War, and then then I then I stayed in the reserves for another two years, and I was going to college, and then um, I decided uh, to get out. Um, of the reserves because it was just being too much. And so then uh, graduated college, I got a job back in central Pennsylvania. And then I started looking for some schools and I found one where um, it was Okinawan. It was, uh, it was Okinawan Tay. He was actually under, uh, what's his name? Um, Drawing a mind blank. Uh, Oyata, Taiko Yata. And uh, <clears throat> So I would go train at his school a little bit. In fact, I taught for him a couple of times. Oh. He, was a, he was a teacher, a karate teacher at a college, and he could make some classes. So he, um, he asked me to fill in, and I did, I think, like four or five times. So Now, that, I, I want to poke at that for a second, because that's not something that happens lately. You know, it's, no, it it's, this is not like, you know, public school in the U.S. where somebody's out sick and they call up literally anyone who's willing to come in that has whatever these minimum credentials are, follow the lesson plan and you'll be fine. There's a lot of trust and a lot of, um, I, I would assume he had seen you training and thought highly of you. How did, how did that, you're smiling. So, so what was interesting was something there. Um, I met him right after I received my, my, my black belt. I received my black belt in 2006, March of 2006. So, <clears throat> what had happened was I got out of college and I was working for several years and went through a divorce. And when that happened, I got heavily back into martial arts. I started having an hour to where my teacher lived, my original teacher, mm. picked up where we left off. And he just wanted to make sure I knew everything. So we, he didn't tell me at first, but we kind of started at not white belt, but I would say like orange. But again, he didn't tell me. And so we're moving along, we're moving along. And all I do is take privates. And so after being with him for about two years, being refreshed, I received my Shodan and it was literally, uh, let's see here. Uh, it was literally 20 years later after I got my brown belt third Q. So when I tell that story to people, people are like, wow, you know, like, n- like not a lot of people do that yeah. at all. So <clears throat> when that happened, when I got my black belt, I had ran into Robert Teller who was the 
he has his own school. Hmm. He was there, like I said, Tycho Yada. And I actually went to a school and I noticed all the history of Okinawa and I had been reading up on it. And so I went in and I talked to him and he was just, he was impressed because not, not a lot of people knew it. Well, the other thing I told him was that my teacher learned from a secondary black belt that was in the Air Force from 60 to 63 over in Okinawa. And he trained with Master Fusei Kisi and Hohan Soken. Hmm. And Sensei Teller looked at me. The first thing he said is, I want to see you do a kata. So I did a kata. I think I did Wansu. And I think I did Anaku. And those are all old style katas. We put our feet together instead of on a 45. And I did the katas and he did not, he didn't, you know, negatively, he said, that's the old Shorinjiru. I said, you're right, Sensei. He goes, they don't teach that anymore. I said, I know, Sensei. I said, I was fortunate to get the old katas from Hohan Soken and, and Master Kisei because of Bob, um, what was his name? Uh, Oh, shoot. Uh, it'll come to me. It's okay. My, my teacher's teacher's name was also Robert. And um, so in Okinawa at that time, it was rare for someone to get a second degree black belt and come back to the States. So Bob must have done very well when he was over there. Mm. Um, my teacher told me that he was very hard on him when he got his black belt. So um, he knew it. But yeah, um, so I, I, I did some training and teaching for them. And then what happened was because of the, because of the job that I was in, I was in the secret service. Um, oh. I, would, I would travel a great deal. So when I would go to a town and I would be there for a couple of days, I'd look for a karate school and I would just go over, take my gi and say, Hey, you guys mind if I, you mind if I come in and train and I'd give my business card and they'd be like, yeah, sure, sure. You know, they, they thought I was going to teach them all this new fancy stuff, but not really. Um, I did show them my style of karate, which was different because now you're in the 2000s and <clears throat> Kisei karate had changed from the seventies in the eighties. It went more to tournament style karate. Mm. And then it changed again, I think in the, in the 19, late 1990s. So I would go in and I would do kata and they would look at me and they'd be like, we've never seen that before. And I'm like, and it, it, it never really surprised me. So. Now, I'm curious, being in the Secret Service, I'm sure there were some complementary skills, some things that you were able to pull in from your training. But I, I'm, I'm just hypothesizing here that there was a tremendous amount of training on evaluation of potential threats at, at a level that most of us don't get. Is that, am I, am I reading that right? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, you know, we would go into assessments. And we would, uh, you know, do vulner vulnerability assessments and we would, uh, you know, we would adjust, we would make our plan. As for, uh, as for the close one-on-one, -on -one, um, we handle things a little bit different than a martial artist would. Sure. After, you have to stay in this frame of mind. When you're a Secret Service agent, you know, I'm, I'm sure you see it all the time with uh, the president, vice president, but there's always agents around them wherever they go, rope lines, stages. So the difference between us and the Secret Service and a martial artist is we're there solely to be there for the safety of what we call the protecting. We're not there to fight the fight, okay? <clears throat> so what a lot of martial artists uh, through training, they would be like, well, what would you do in a case like this? I said, a case like this, depending on what, where I am, my position, I would most likely, you know, defend the protectee, uh, tuck, grab, and go. And they, and they would look at me and they'd be like, so you wouldn't fight? I go, no, that's not what we're there for. That's not what we're there for. Now we have this rule, and I teach this in karate, it's called the 90-10% rule. 90% of your attention goes to the protectee and 10% goes to the problem. Mm. So you can apply that in martial arts. Suppose you're at a you're at a mall, which is I know rare these days, but let's say you're at a mall and you're walking to your car and you see two guys just standing in the front of your car that absolutely have no reason there, and you get that funny feeling in your stomach. Well, you got two kids with you, little ones. So now your mind starts thinking real fast, wow, this is not good. 
So what you need to do is you need to apply the 90%, 10% rule. 90% of all of your energy goes toward those two kids and you're going to do an about face and you're going to go back to the mall. You know what I mean? Sense. You're going to go get a security guard and say, I need you to walk me to the car. Now, instead of just two on one, there's two on two. <clears throat> um, in another sense, you're at the car. You didn't see anybody come up. But now someone comes up from your back. So what do you do? You take the kids, you shove them in the car, you close the door. 10% is in the car. The 90% is right here in your face now. You're dealing with it. So see, those are two scenarios. Mm. Um, it, as a martial artist, you start to think in those terms of, it is, it's split second is deciding. Yeah. And you, need to, you need to take care of it. So like if we're on a rope line and someone which rarely ever happens. Um, if someone would pull something out of their jacket and they would make like a feverish move towards one or two of us is going to just grab that person and grab whatever they have and just take it right to the ground because if it goes to the ground. Nobody gets hurt. And you have to remember, we're still liable for all those civilians there. So it is definitely a different frame of mind of thinking, but I can remember we went to India the one time and uh, I was with uh, George Bush George W. when he was former, and we were at a dinner and, you know, people were just coming up. It was an outside dinner. People were just coming up and they wanted to shake his hand and they really liked him over there. And um, he just got to the point where they were starting to shove us a little bit. And mm. I'm looking at the detail leader and I'm like, you know, we need to, we need to like, we need to let these people know. So what I started doing was I learned from one of my from one of my colleagues, instructors in martial arts is hips and shoulders, hips and shoulders. So I started literally just pushing people's shoulders and I would use my knee to tap their hip and they would lose balance. And they would look at me and I'd be like, back up, just get, just back up. So uh, there's a lot of things you can use in the martial arts that aren't necessarily punching and kicking. Wow. Yeah, I, I think all of my, quote, knowledge about what the Secret Service is and, and, and how those details are different from conventional law enforcement and security comes from movies, right? So I don't pretend that right. anything that's in here is actually real. But the focus, I mean, you articulated it really well, and I understand it now being so different there's a bit of uh, a willingness of self-sacrifice in there there is um you know we plan so that we don't have to take a bullet you know but and you know we do wear vests so um but our our ideology and our uh our system of, of doing things is geared to uh a lot of its pre-planning you know it's like when you go on a vacation your vacation is going to be great if you pre-plan it because when you have a plan in place and you hit a hiccup or, you know, you're traveling down the vacation highway and an exit is closed, you can adjust more quickly. Hmm. You've already pre-planned. Now, I'm not to say that um, by the seat of your pants vacations, they're fun. But again, you, you may not get the complete quality out of it. So... There is no pre-planning for martial artists when they go out on the street. The only pre-planning they have is training. That's the only thing they have is training and whether they're good or not, uh, because a bad pushing fight can go real south with a knife, yeah. you know, or a gun or two people. Um, whereas with us, we always pre-planned everything and we kind of always made sure that that plan would work. So. Was there ever a situation where you thought, you know, I'm glad I had my martial arts background. What I learned in the Secret Service wasn't, w wouldn't have been quite enough. Yeah, uh, 2014, October 23rd, there was a fence jumper at the White House and I was working down there. Mm. I was on temporary duty there. <clears throat> it was like 7.23 at night, I think. I was at uh, post four, A4. It is the post in front of the White House where all the press goes in to get their equipment magged. They walk through a magnetometer and 
at the time I was just helping out. Uh, there was a bunch of us down there. So, uh, augmenting and, um, I was in a full suit, wingtip shoes. Uh, the UD officers were there and, and all of a sudden the alarm goes off this loud alarm. The whole booth lights up. Every booth lights up around the, and we had a fence jumper and the guy jumped over the fence, like literally about 25 feet from me, but it was dark. And it was hard to see. And there was a big window to my right here. <clears throat> and I looked out. So when that happens, these big like NFL football lights come on in the White House lawn and it lights it up like a stadium. <clears throat> I look out there and I see this guy out there. I'm like, whoa, how did he get there? And um, so I literally went in my head, one, two, I'm out of here. I turned around and went out this door and I deployed my gun. Um, I had a bead on him. I was just waiting for this guy to see what he was going to do. You have to remember, this is the second fun, uh, fence jumper in like five weeks. Hmm. And the first one got in the house, the two agents. I remember that. Remember that? Yeah. So I went out and, <clears throat> you know, I got closer, I got closer. And I noticed the guys, ERT had their long guns. So I put my gun away. At that point, the guy picked up one of the canines. He threw him down. Well, now I'm like, okay, that's assault on an officer because the dogs wore badges. I deployed my gun again. He was doing some funky stuff with his shirt. He turned. It looked like he was going to try to run to me because I was in a I was in a very dark spot. I wasn't lit up, and so I kept going out after him. And then I got closer. All of a sudden, the RT just honed in on him. I let the dogs go. They they took him down by each arm. And by that time, I got up there. I just put my gun away because it I didn't need it out. Um, and I just got my cuffs out. So. Then it started to happen real fast. They called the dogs off and uh, Chase Clouser, who I was in Pittsburgh at the time and Chase was from Pittsburgh. He was a, <clears throat> I think he was an offensive lineman for Pitt University. He was <laughs> six, five, six, five, 290. <laughs> Huge guy. So he gets the guy in a figure four on the ground with his left arm underneath him. And he was, uh, he was trying to, get his arm out. I said, stand by. And I reached under and I grabbed him by the wrist. I got him in a really hard wrist lock. And he just gave his arm right up. And I brought it up. I put a cuff on, I passed it to Chase and he put a cuff on it. He picked him up. We did a quick search and we took him off campus. And, um, I think that, you know, me knowing some joint locks and some other things from martial arts, I think that helped us really, really apprehend him quickly. Mm. Wow. And I would imagine too the 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 comfort with adrenaline, right? Because whether 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 it's something that we experience in martial arts at, extensively or even just a little bit, most people don't have a lot of experience with w- <clears throat> how to no. function under an adrenalized state. Yeah, it's um, well, you know, you you have to look at it this way when you're when you're doing that job. You know, you got you got the president or the vice president stand there or another high ranking official from another country. You can't you can't be let down. You can't let people down. You know, more importantly, you can't let your teammates down. That's the thing. We're only as good as the weakest link. So you got to make sure your agent buds to your left and right are doing just as well. And if they're having a little bit of trouble, say, with one of the one of the people on the rope line, you need to fill that hole and you need to make it, make it solid for everybody. So, you know, it's, um, it's kind of a unity thing, um, Mm -hmm. with us. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I can tell you, um, I was with John Kerry when he was running and, um, we were in, um, somewhere in Colorado, I think, or Idaho. And we did a, we did a, a rally there. And I think there was 20,000 people. So we walk out with him. I was a site agent, meaning they follow me because I know everywhere to go. And so we walk out there and we hit the rope line afterwards. You could just, when you hit the rope, you could feel the energy go like this. It's, and after a while, you, uh, you become a junkie on that. You do. Mm, I look forward to it. And it just, you know, it gets you there. So. Right on. Now, what's your martial arts looking like through this time? Are you training? Are you not training? Is it a catch as catch can? Um, right now, actually, <clears throat> I was training up until about maybe a month ago because 
we're trying to move. We're trying to move okay. now just uh, like a short distance, like maybe 20 minutes away from here. So I've been kind of involved in that. Um, it's also August. Uh, so when I first moved down to North Carolina from Pittsburgh, I tried opening a school, but um, the area wasn't really uh, conducive to karate. It's more BJJ up there and like Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. So um, I decided to put it in the back burner. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still willing to go out and teach at schools. I did that for a good bit of time just because my busy schedule um, in the Secret Service. So, you know, I, I knew of people uh, that had schools and um, I trained with them. So they would, you know, ask me to come back at certain times and I would, I would go train different, different aspects, you know, whether it was self-defense or kata or, you know, or, or just um, drill, you know, do drills with them because mm -hmm. schools don't do the, the, the 25 basics that uh, he say did uh, back in the day. And they're actually, they're very good. They're, they really show the um, instructor if, if the students got that kick or punch down. So. Nice. Okay. And so we've talked about a lot of different, uh, I guess we can call them phases, relationships to martial arts. Are there common threads? I, I, I'm hearing some things, but I'm curious when you look at your life as a martial artist or career or whatever word you would use there, you know, can you, can you pull out a, here, let me ask it in a different way. If you were to write an autobiography, about your time as a martial artist, what would you call it? Well, I, I thought about this because I thought about writing a book. Oh, really? Oh, cool. I didn't yeah, know I that. thought about writing a book. In fact, I um, had a counterfeit case um, that was uh, one of the best ones in the Secret Service. It, uh, it involved an uh, American over in Uganda. Mm -hmm. I went over there three times from 2014 to... 2015, he was making millions of dollars and um, he did it by offset printing. Mm -hmm. um, I went to school for printing, offset and screen printing. <laughs> so when I interviewed this guy in a Uganda jail and asked him what kind of printing press they used, he um, like, oh, I really don't know. And I got on my phone, I said, did it look like this? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, a lot like that. And I said, you know, I'm a printer by trade. And he's, he just, he was like, oh, so now he couldn't, he didn't, he couldn't pull the wool over the sheep's eyes, you know? Yeah. So anyway, um, uh, so let me re refresh my memory on the, uh, oh, the different phases. Okay. Um, the question, um, there was relevance to that. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I had restructured the question as, you know, what you might call your autobiography. And just, oh. you know, as a, as a, as an aside, you never have to answer the question. The goal here is just to keep you talking. Right. No, most of the time, if you saying, listen to most episodes, about half the questions I ask don't actually get answered. And it's totally fine. That's okay. No, um, I, having a chat. Thought about, um, I thought about, I know it's kind of generic, but um, my journey, mm. journey from, uh, martial arts through the air force and secret service. And I guess the one thing I, I could always say is what stayed consistent was I stayed with it. Hmm. Jobs didn't deter me from taking it. In some cases it got me back into it. Hmm. So I, I would say, you know, something like my journey um, through, through karate. Um, I would definitely incorporate the karate in the book along with um, my, uh, my Air Force time and my uh, service time. Because when I when I when I would travel in the Secret Service, I actually made it over to Hawaii a couple of times, and I got to train with a guy over there, John Aki. He's Hawaiian. He does Gojuru. Hmm. It was really neat. I would I would I would go to a different state or a different place, and I would be able to just take my gi and go train. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. You talked about. You didn't use this word, but the way you described being on the Secret Service made me think of a team. And anybody that I've ever talked to who has served in the military would use similar words. Again, they might not call it a team, but similar dynamic. And I got a little bit of the sense that that might have been the attitude of that early training when you were young, talking about a younger group, 
going pretty hard. And then the way you talked about maintenance training with those other two gentlemen, it sounded very team like. Am I reading that? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, the um <clears throat> so because our teacher was so different, um, he was very, very soft spoken. Um, he had no, he had very little ego. Like I said, he took more of the Eastern, um, like he's a vegetarian. He's been since 16. Um, he's very much into like, um, Buddhism. Um, he taught me a good bit about like Buddhism and how it's parallel with Catholicism. Um, cause we, he, him and I actually were both brought up Catholics, but, um, uh, what he did was he, he took the Eastern side of it more so rather than the hardcore Jap, uh, Japanese or Okinawan. And, um, you know, he always said it's, um, it's better to say, to stay softer, not weaker, but softer and more pliable through your martial arts career as to get brittle and hard, brittle and hard breaks, softer and, and limber or pliable. They, they tend to bend and they, and they tend to go. And that's, you know, that's what you really want to do. You want to stay pliable. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. He just had a different, uh, different mentality. And so Barry Plar and Dennis Herring, the two guys that I consistently hung around with, they, they, you know, kept the same thoughts. And, um, what was interesting was what was really interesting is I then started training with a guy from Allentown, Tim Hoover. And, um, he does a podcast with, um, Steve Mittman. I don't know if you ever heard of Steve. No, they're in, they're in the Lehigh Valley. You may want to check it out. Um, yeah. Theirs is based on karate. It's attack life, not others. It's a weekly uh, on Thursdays. But anyway, I started I started training at his school because he also took karate from my master Tim Hawk also, and he got up to fifth don like I did. And um, so he would invite me over specifically to teach kata to his students. So Hoover he he had more of a uh, definitely an 80s style karate, you know, like K1 back in the day. So he was really to like working out, kicking the bag, punching the bag, um, doing burpees, doing some, you know, push-ups. Uh, and I, I would go and I would teach kata and I would do application. And seriously, the students would be in awe. They would come up and they'd ask me, oh, my God, I, you know, I've been doing this kata for five years and I never saw this. Mm. I, said, I know it's because you were just going through the motions. I said, there comes a time in your martial art where you go to a next level and something pushes you there. And what it 90 percent of the time, what it is, it is self-discovery. Someone doesn't teach it to you. It's self-discovery. You're doing something one day and all of a sudden you have this epiphany and you're like, oh, now I get it. Now I know. So I would go back and I would do kata for Tim Hoover and I would get done and he would, he would say, you look exactly like Tim Hawk. So there's a compliment there. Sure. Um, but then there's also, as you get older, you start to, that, that master, um, um, copying kind of sheds and you actually become now part of the kata. That to me is where you're going deeper and you actually are being successful at it. Um, and I, I always said this to the students there and I always said to them, don't take this negatively, but I said, it's just another perspective to take and for you to decide what you want to do with your martial art. I said, you have to understand that you own your karate, you know, whether it's Tim Hawks or Tim Hoover's or mine, you have to own your karate because nobody does it for you. You do it. And I said, so maybe what you should do is instead of kicking the bag so much, because the bag won't kick back, maybe you should start to look at your kata from two different directions, a defensive and an offensive. Because I brought to their mind, I said, how many people think katas are defensive? And just about everybody raises their hand. And I said, I personally think there's no defensiveness in kata. I think it's all offensive. But we teach defensive because it is the yin way. Hmm. So what I do when I was in Texas for four years, 
I would practice on my patio like four out of five days. One day I would do nothing but defensive side and do bunkai and oyo. And then the next day I would do offensive. I would actually do the kata, jump over the other side and see what that other person was doing. And it, it opened up a new world to me. It really did. Um, I, think I, like that, I think that's where I made my leap. Hmm. Really cool. Can, can you say, say more about kata is offensive versus defensive? I, I, I think I need a little more, and I, I suspect <laughs> listeners do too. Okay. So, in, uh, and I don't know if you can see this, but like in, in my opinion too, we start off and we bow. And we turn and we do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, everybody thinks what you're doing is, and you probably are, but I have another application for it. When you're going like this, you're actually blocking something over here. I'm not really sure what this is. <laughs> I think this uh, is kind of because this thing. will likely be an audio episode, and at least most of our people will listen to it, even as video. So, folks, demonstrating what most of us would would call. Pinyon or Heian need on with the, the kind of the double block at the beginning. Right. And then you're striking and then you're punching. Mm -hmm. Well, I look at it as completely offensive in terms of you're standing there. Someone comes up from behind you and grabs your arms, your wrists. So you're, what you're doing is you're turning on a 45. Now your hip is no, you're not centered with them. Now you're off center mm. up like this. And they're probably holding on. And now you have their left arm in your left hand and you're bringing their right arm down and you're taking their left over and they're basically being tied up like that. In that position, they're, they're helpless. They can't do anything because one, their hands and their weapons are taken and their back is now bent over. So if you get them bent over, that's no good. If you get their back to bend backwards and lock, it's no good either. So... With kata, I think you have to look at it from a body mechanic stance. You always want to be on a 45 when you're doing your technique because you're slicing through their energy and you definitely want to go with their core. You want to go into their core yeah. and you don't want to focus so much on their weapons. You want to go for their core because if I get your center, if I get a hold of your center and I manipulate that, it doesn't matter what your hands or feet are doing. Yeah, that that the way you're saying that reminds me very much of the bits that I've heard from Chinese martial arts practitioners more so than Okinawan and Japanese or Korean right. practitioners. Yeah, they they tend to hit hard. So my teacher taught me there's soft, 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 hard, hard, soft, and then hard, hard. Being that soft, soft would be Tai Chi, and then your hard, hard would be like your your Tang Sudos, your Taekwondos you know, 90% kicks, a lot of knife hand strikes, really hard. Um, and then your Okinawan and your, um, you know, your Aikido, they, they fall within hmm. hard or hard soft. So, um, interesting. Okay. Oh, kata, um, you know, kata is very good for, uh, for balance. It's very good for centering. Um, teaching, Teaching especially young students how to do the half moon walk is difficult. They just, um, it's almost like they can't do two things at one time. But what I tell them though is with the half moon walk, um, which means, you know, your, your feet are in your normal forward position, the toes of your right foot, if your left foot's forward, your toes are 45 from the heel of your left foot. And as you, as you move, your feet never really leave the ground. They just slide and they do a half moon. Well, if you do half moon steps, you can always turn in either direction and still be well balanced and centered. Yeah. You got my wheels turning. Stuff that I've been <laughs> thinking about, but, you know, obviously hearing it with, with even different words. This is one of my favorite things about what, what I personally get to do with this show is is you know now i'm going to go and my brain's just going to keep running away and of course i've got more more conversations i'm having with people today so i'm gonna have to push the pause button on my brain but i dig this stuff what about the future you say you're moving uh the way you talked about the efforts to open a school sounded like you weren't done with that 
effort that maybe post move that's something you're going to explore again? Yeah, I think I think I'm going to try to. Um, I got a friend, uh, Mark Barler. He has the BKA Barler Karate Association up in uh, Galleon, Ohio, and he's got a couple of senseis under him. And um, you know, we've we've been friends for like I think 15 years now. And um, he's just like, you know, he goes, you should just open up a school, maybe someplace where you could, you know, pay a little rent, just 16 years and older, um, pay cash, you know. And just have old school karate. I said, yes, that's what I'd like to do. So I did teach uh, at a community center uh, about, it was two years ago, uh, almost three, in uh, December, January. And, you know, it's unfortunate that when you teach at a place like that, you have to go through all of the red tape. Mm. So... I mean, back in the day when you and you and, you and I took karate in the eighties, you went in there and you you signed a waiver for the teacher, <laughs> which you know was just the one sheet paid, and like that was it. And either your parents dropped you off and they came back, you know, whenever, or, or I just showed up and you know and that was that. And um, but now, if you're around uh, younger than eighteen years old, you got to have police checks, you got to have, you know, insurance. Especially if you want to teach it like a government facility, like a like a, a borough or a township or you know something like that, you know. And and I understand why they do it, but it's just like um, it really, really has taken some of the fun out of it, you know. It it really has, and uh, and you know I always laugh because you know it's twenty years Secret Service, and you just don't let anybody in there, you know. And um, so uh, I miss the old school type. Uh, I'm really hoping that I can find a place like, you know, like a yoga studio that only has, you know, class three times a week and maybe two days to go in. And, Cause that's all I really want to do is teach two days. Um, I think today it's a, really about how much time people have. And, but then there is another issue. There's an Ishinru school down, uh, about 20 minutes from my house where I hopefully will be living. And, um, he's a good guy. Um, he, he's a retired cop. So we, you know, we have the same, um, wavelength pattern, if you put it. And, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to try to hook up with him and maybe do something just uh, because, you know, another another black belt always has a different perception. And and I know that it would be good. Plus, the great thing is his style already does all the katas that I do, except for one. And they, of course, they vary a little bit, but it's, you know, this technique compared to that one, not a big deal. You just teach to the kids like, well, they replaced it with this, but it's still the same motion. It's still the same idea. So I think once especially young kids, I think once they understand that they're going to be like, okay, okay. So it's not like way off, you know, not trying to teach me something totally new. So, yeah. So I would, I, I think I would still like to do it. Cause I mean, I think you I mean, look at all the karate guys, you know, and, and Tai Chi and all, look how long they're living. They're living long. So. Yeah. That's good stuff. It's yeah. And, and, and I hope you do because I'm just, I'm hearing in your words that it's, it's something that you miss. It is the, the sharing, just the, the word choice you have in talking to me. You're you're sharing. I mean, I have no doubt that we could we could run for hours, especially there are questions I'm I'm intentionally not asking you because I know you would you would just go. And <laughs> but given a different context, those would be a lot of fun. And and you you might be one of maybe three people who pushed the chair back, got up and demonstrated something. Okay. Ever on yeah. the show. So that's so yeah, yeah it's that a says visual. a lot to me. Totally. My, my one buddy, Dennis uh, Herring, uh, the other black guy, he's like, he used to tell me, you're a visual, you're a visual person, Tim. He's mm-hmm. learned by visual. And he goes, you most likely will teach by visual. But I can tell you this. There's another uh, interesting thing. So my, my master, Tim Hawk, um, we did not test for cue belts. He gave you a syllabus, a sheet of paper, and explained to you what you're going to learn. And you learned it. And then... Um, probably a week or maybe two, or depending, you know, how weak or strong you were after you had, he had taught you all, all that information. He would come up to you after class one night and he would just say, hey, everybody, we're going to promote Tim to a uh, green belt. He's been working hard. And uh, so everybody, you know, gather around and he would, he would just present it to me and then everybody would shake, shake my hand. And it was, it was, that was it. It was kind of cool. However, for the black belt, and because when you get your black belt, the, the one thing I don't like about 
martial arts is that the average person thinks that you get a black belt, you're an expert. Mm. I, 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 th- I harp on that. I let people know, no, you're not an expert by any means. What you are is you're a certified individual in that style. You have learned everything up to that point that was given to you and you've passed it with a successful grade. Now, will there be other information? There will be other information, but probably not basics because you don't need the basics anymore. You have the basics and you're supposed to train with them, explore them, and try to discover new things by going deeper. So, um, you know, with that being said, um, when you took your black belt, your showdown with Tim uh, Hawk, you would start at white belt and you would start to explain everything to him, including stretches. Um, You'd go through your katas and you would do it three times. One for application, meaning how, what you were doing. Two, you would describe it as if you were on the phone talking to a person they couldn't. And then three, you would do it for great form. This was a long test. What's that? This was a long test. Yes, you had to take private lessons. And it lasted about five, six months. One of, yeah. So um, I had asked him one time, I said, so you don't think sparring is important? He goes, no, I don't, not for a test. He said, sparring is just one of those things that you do. It's to, you know, kind of keep your mind fresh, see how things work. Because when you spar, you really, really never go full bore. I mean, you, we, we only sparred with no protection because when you're out in the street, you're not going to have it. Sure. So, um, so yeah, he said, I just did not feel that was, you know, important. He goes, I felt what was very important was what you were doing. Are you doing it correctly? And I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, and, you know, to be honest with you, I think we all have enough stressful situations in our life that we can kind of figure it out, you know? Um, but yeah. And what he did, um, for your second degree is he made you start at white belt again for the time. So I, I, I know he had some reasoning behind it, um, because he, uh, he had his master's degree in psychology. So he had a psychology side to teaching his martial arts. Um, but that's all he did and teach. So, you know, I kind of think that with his black belt students, he knew that they were there and they were going to stick around. I'm thinking he probably thought, well, I'll make some money off of it too. So, you know, to each his own, that's fine. Yep. Um, but like one, one principle he taught me, um, being a psychology major is that he said, if you want to learn something in martial arts, you do it five times. And this is where I thought that this was really interesting because he really thought about this. He says, when you do a cod of five times, it gets embedded into your, um, subconscious so that when you meditate now you can focus on that kata and you'll actually do it better down the road because they've done studies where they took three basketball teams and they took one team and they practiced and that's all they did then there was a team that didn't practice and they played mm. poorly it's the team that practiced, but meditated about winning. They were the best. So that's why I think martial arts is different than lifting weights or running laps or, cause I was a cross country runner, high school and college. And, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of you're at peace at some point and you can just go forever. Well, that is still a different feeling that when you get done with a karate workout, a good karate workout, you just feel completely like um, you feel like that glowing ball, mm. the ball, you know, you feel very uh, complete and you're, you're centered and you're balanced. You don't always feel that way when you get out of the weight room or off a, off a run on a real hot day, you know? It's true. Mm. Good stuff. What's next? What's next for you? And let me, let me ask it in a different way. Let's pretend we come back. It's five years from now. And I say, hey, Tim, what have you been up to martial arts wise? What would you hope you were telling me? 
Well, I hope I'd be telling you that I'm still involved in it and that I'm still going to some schools or I, I even have my own school. And, you know, what I'm looking at is I, I don't want a real big school. OK, I've. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the Air Force, I've been in government. Um, I've, I've been all around teaching at different schools and, you know, bigger is definitely not better. More is not better. OK, it's just it's more work. And so what I would be happy with is I'd be happy with like, say, eight students, eight solid students, you know, just so that they could pair up and I wouldn't get beat up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, and I mean, uh, you know, uh, guys and gals that really are dedicated, and really want to learn and they really want to go deep. And, um, you know, they take their their karate serious, like their kicks are hard snapped. Their punches are good. They're solid. You know, um, they, they they do the kata with. Um, you know, with a lot of oomph and, and feeling and just, you know, like they can imagine that, that opponent in front of them and they're really, really trying to take them out. Um, I, I'd like to get to that point with the school and, uh, you know, just, I would really, really enjoy teaching the students uh, about the history of karate and also the Okinawan way. Um, in 2010, um, I was on GW's detail and, um, my mother had passed a year before and uh, I got some money. And so um, I, she always said, you should go to Okinawa. You should go because you like it so much. So I took the money and I went and I took two other guys with me. They were martial artists. And um, I actually, I used to teach at the guy's school in Allentown, Pennsylvania, Coopersburg, actually, Coopersburg. And so I took him over there and um, uh, he was 50 some at the time. I was like 44. And, uh, so that was like thir- that was like thirteen years ago. I just turned I just turned fifty seven on Sunday. So happy um, birthday! Thanks. And um, so a younger gentleman, uh, Matt Faragasso, went with us, and uh, he was a black belt. But when I when I took these guys over there, I organized the whole thing. It was you know I because of traveling because I traveled so much. So we get over there and um, we train with this one guy, Ron Nix. Um, he has does Sato Khan over there. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got the chance to meet up with, uh, Fusei Kisi on his birthday. Cool. Um, but you know, we also went and saw the culture side of it and, uh, you could just tell that, um, these two guys were like, they'll never do that again in their life. And I, and I think that, um, I think what I brought to them was basically a once in a lifetime thing. Um, because it's, I just think people are a little hesitant to, I always say, pull the trigger on something because they're afraid of failing or they're afraid get nervous, of yeah. And I get it. I get it. But again, if you go back to pre-planning, it, it pretty much works. You can always adjust. But no, I had a really good time over there. And well, I want to take my wife over the last couple of years. But with the current situation and flying and all that, it's just um, it's just not doable right now. So we'll have to wait and see. But. Hopefully that opens up soon. The reason why I bring that up is I would like to get a group of students and take them over there and expose them to real Okinawan karate schools. Mm. And uh, I was just telling my wife the other day, uh, Bob Teller, the gentleman I mentioned before, he said uh, he was in the Air Force too, and he would work midnight shift. And he said what he would do is when he was done with his midnight shift, he would, he was a medic. He would go to the dojo that he was training with. He didn't train with one master, but he trained with like, I think eight or nine. So he got a really good mix. And, um, but he said the dojo would open at like 6 a.m. in the morning and it would stay open until like 10 at night. Mm. He said, you would go over there, you would walk in and no matter what they were doing, you would just, you'd bow to the teacher and you'd jump in and you would just start training for as long as you could. And then you would back out, you'd bow out. And you, so it was not like, it's not like we do in the States here. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. So I thought that was really, really cool because on any given day, you really didn't know what you were going to learn or what you were going to practice. It was kind of like a smorgasbord, you know? So I kind of, I kind of, I kind of think that's cool. So the way I'd run my school is I think uh, like if I had a Tuesday, Thursday, I think Tuesdays, I would do a formal class so that they learn the formal way. They learn all the procedures, the protocols. And then on Thursday, I'd be like, Hey, when you show up, you bow in with me and it'd just be a quick bow in and what we're doing is what we're doing. Jump in and, or if you want to go and do work on kata, I would never tell a person, no, don't do kata. 
I would just say, you know, I would have an area set up for just cod and say, you go over and train with that. And, um, you know, and the other principle I want to bring up to you, and I think this is really important for any instructors out there. I think when a new student comes into the school, and this applies to that student all the way through their belts, I think the head sensei should teach the kata first. Not a green belt, not a brown belt. I mean, I mean not even a udansha. Okay. The master needs to teach the kata first time and, and maybe second display to the student. Then the others can can help out. Do Why? You know, I'll tell you. It's the Xerox copy principle. So you you have a piece of paper that's printed off the computer. It's called a first generation print. Okay. You take that and you put that copy on the copier and you hit 100. So it goes in there, right? Now, typically what people do is they take that one that you just made a copy and they put that on top and they take the number 100th copy and they put it in the drawer. Now you go to make more copies. You take that one out, you put it on the platen, you do another 100. Now those 100 are second generation. Actually, no, they're third generation because that first 100 is second generation. Mm -hmm. Now you've got 100 of third generation. So that last one that's third generation goes in the drawer. So you know what happens after about six, seven times. Yeah, it starts to degrade. You can see it. It weighs. It's, right? it's not the same. It's not accurate. It's the same principle as you start at the beginning of the class. You whisper something into it, students here, and they start to do it. And by the time it gets to the end, it's just like, what? Yeah. The same thing happens with teaching kata. The same exact same thing, because everybody's going to do something a little different. And after a while, you're going to deteriorate the kata. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be, the, not, not that it's pure, but it's not going to be the same from the master. So I think that's really important. I really do. I like it. I, I, I think that we're at a time where head instructors, especially those who have been training for a while, you know, they, they look at themselves and, oh, I can't go quite as fast or quite as hard as I used to. And they forget that, you know, there's all this nuance to what they do that sometimes they don't even realize they're doing it, that, Setting that example, like you're talking about, I think is so important. I completely agree. I think also that's what's, what's interesting is I'll, I'll watch old footage, black and white uh, footage of Keith, of uh, Hohan Sokin doing kata. And it looks like nothing like I do. Well, of, when he's doing the kata, he's like 78 or 79. And I'm like, of course, he's not going to do it the same as like when he did it when he was 28, you know? Right. I think a lot of people forget that, but the one thing in martial arts that, that really surprises me is you'll get a lot of people that they lose concept of what it's about. It's about losing your ego. It's, it's, about, um, it's about not embellishing things and not, and not, here's the other thing, not humbling everything to the point of the most humble position. So you know what the one the one thing I really don't like to hear from high-ranking black belts, hmm. oh, I have so much more to learn. Really? Now, I mean, yes, there's, there's always areas to learn. But really, you've been doing it like, okay, I will have been doing this 38 years. You can only throw a kick and a punch so many ways, right? And then it's... Yeah. And then I, well, it, it may not be a punch then. It may be a strike because it's an arc. You know, it's an arc form. So that's what my teacher taught me. He said a punch is from point A to point B. Well, if you do a hammer fist, it's going to be a circle. Well, now that's a strike. That's not a punch. So there's a difference. Mm -hmm. It's if you can recognize it and articulate it. So I just think that and I'm talking like seven degrees and higher. I think when they say in front of a group at, when they're teaching, oh, I, I have so much more to learn. I'm like, really? <laughs> well, like, honestly, it's like you're at the, you're at 
the head of your organization or your school. Mm. That would be like we go into we go into a doctor's office and we start talking to a cardiologist. And he's like 55 years old. And he says, yeah, he goes, this is your situation. But man, I have a lot to learn. I'd be like, what? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's like this. I think Chuck Norris said at the one time, he said, you can never take an education away from somebody. Once you get it, you have it. Once you've learned it, you can forget it. But if you, if you maintain it, they, they can't take it away from you. So I look at that the same way with karate. You know, I look at, as you're going through your belts, when you get your black belt, it's, it's sort of like getting your, your bachelor's degree. I mean, there's a lot of information there. And you have the basics. So when you have your, your, master, your, your bachelor's degree, you have all the basics for your curriculum. So now you move on to your master's. Well, I say your master's would be second to fifth degree. And then I would say from, from sixth, seventh, and, and possibly eighth, would be your doctorate of martial arts. Because the reason why is there's only one tenth done mm -hmm. in a system. And there's typically on, only one or two ninth dons because that's all you need. And then the rest are eighth and lower. So if you, if you put it in perspective of, to ed, of education and titles, because I think we tend to, we can, not all of us think like that, but we can recognize that, you know? So I think, you know, as a, Definitely as a seventh degree, if you're a Shihan and you're, and you're teaching at a school or you're running the school, I'm going to say you have to know pretty much. You really do. You know, and, um, you know, again, it's like being a lieutenant colonel in the squadron. You're running that thing, you know, and you've got an operations officer who's also a lieutenant colonel. But, you know, he takes care of the personnel and the operations while you're taking care of the whole organization. Well, I look at the same way, you know. And it's like, I would hate for my lieutenant colonel to say, yeah, I'm running the squadron, but I have a lot to learn. Really? Like, okay, you know, you're a professional. You, you see where I'm going with that? Yeah, I do. So um, I think sometimes people can be a, a little too humbling in that, you know, you don't have to say, I, I need to learn a whole lot. I have, I have a lot to learn. No, I think that a better way to say it is, I really still need to refine what I have. Well said. So if people want to get a hold of you, are you willing to share any, any contact oh, yeah. info, email or anything like that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can tell you on the phone or I can email it to you or. Well, if, if, if you wouldn't mind letting people know here, if, if you're willing to put yourself out to them. Oh yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can reach me at um, R E T S S A four nine one two at gmail.com. And I would just say this, if, uh, if they email me, then I can pass my other information on to them. Yeah, perfect. And then, um, uh, you know, we'll be good. I mean, like I said, I do, I do seminars. Um, I also do talks for, uh, I've got a program set up for, it's basically my career in the secret service and has a lot oh, okay. of highlights. And, um, I, I actually was able to do a lot of really, really neat stuff. Um, and, uh, like spur of the moment things. Let's put it that way. So um, it was, it was, it was a good time. It was fun. Awesome. This is where we wind up. So I'll let you have the final word. What do you want to leave everybody <laughs> listening with? Um, well, I think the one thing with karate <clears throat> um, and specifically Okinawan karate, I think that it is definitely a personal art. You need to take responsibility for it in terms of that. It's your art. You're the one that's going to do it. When you go to take a test, someone's not going to do that test for you. Um, I would also say with regards to people doing their karate, when they go to tournaments um, and they perform kata or they spar or whatever, take the judges with a grain of salt when they, when they uh, test your kata because your master is really the only one that should really critique you on your katas because like I said in the beginning, he taught you and now you reflect him. And so what I would hope that judges do, and this is what I always do, because I've sat in a lot of black belt um, tests over the years. I would always look for the, the basic principles and philosophies like, 
okay, is that person's stance really good? Are they stepping properly when they throw their punch, you know? And I watch their transitions. Always ask my students this, what's the difference between a basic kata, an intermediate, and a, um, what would you call it? Advanced, advanced. They have the toughest time. I tell them it's always the transition. Whether you do an I pattern, an H pattern, you go off on 45. That's the difference between an advanced kata and a basic kata. Because you're going to do a head block, a head block every time, no matter what kata you're doing. You're going to do a front snap kick. So again, it's, it's, it's transition. It's, it's not so much you're throwing techniques out there that are just um, secretive and spiritual. And, you know, they're, you know, they're going to take the person by surprise. So. Hmm. Yeah, I would just say, you know, keep your karate yours and, um, you know, try to do the best that you can for your sensei, but don't, don't let others, uh, don't, uh, definitely don't let others put you down and just walk away from someone that starts to say, well, that martial arts, no good. No open mind there. I think my biggest takeaway from my conversation was despite progress, despite rank advancements, titles, Etc. There was no point in our conversation where I got the sense that Soke Tim changed his value in training. He was still dedicated, still is dedicated, still seems to see martial arts with the same, um, let's call it wide eye enjoyment that he did when he was younger. And I think that that is amazing. And it's something that, as I consider it, something I see in myself, something that I see in so many of the guests that we've had, you might call it a white belt mentality, but I think it's, it's more than that. It's love for the arts, love for training, love for bettering ourselves. And I can't imagine anything better than that. So... So, okay, thanks for coming on. Thanks for chatting with me. I really appreciated our time. Hey, do you want to know more? What, let's go over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes. Again, this is episode 750. Yeah, we've done 750 of these. And you're going to find a whole bunch of cool stuff over there. You can sign up for our newsletter, lots of stuff. You can even make a donation if you don't want to support us in the other ways. Yeah, there's a way you can make a one-time donation with PayPal. But if you want to support us in one of the other ways, don't forget, sharing episodes, leaving reviews, buying books on Amazon, any of that good stuff, we really do appreciate it. Hey, you want me to come out to your school and do a seminar? I can do that. That's an option. We're booking for 2023 right now. So reach out. And if you're listening to this far into the future, we're probably still booking for next year, whatever that year is. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 to save 15% at whistlekick.com. And if you've got suggestions, feedback, guest suggestions, topic suggestions. We do want to hear them. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.